Uh, the next speaker um, for our conference is Dr. Larry Birnbaum. Dr. Larry is a professor of computer science at Northwestern and also uh, the program mentor for the artificial intelligence and data science course here at Geo Institute. Uh, one of his key research focuses is on methods um, for the automation generation of content by machine, including specifically the automatic generation of narratives from data. Most of the projects in Dr. Larry's lab are aimed at automating and supporting all aspects of the content pipeline, including research, content generation, content distribution, and user interaction with content. Um, over to you, Dr. Larry. Thanks very much, Rita. And um, we too, let me, let me uh, let's see if I can do this right here. Is, uh, is the PowerPoint uh, visible here? Yes, yes it is. Okay, great, thanks very much. And uh, thank you for, thank you again, we too. And uh, thank you to uh, Geo Institute for uh, putting on the symposium and Nile for organizing it and together with you and, and uh, inviting me today. And um, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit, I, I should say I serve uh, here as a, I'm a visiting professor this year at Geo Institute this fall. Um, where I also serve, as you mentioned, as the program advisor and architect for the AI and data science program together with my colleague, uh, Shailesh Kumar. So um, I'm gonna say something, maybe a very specific project I've been working on uh, over the last you know, um, about data storytelling and internet scale. So this is gonna be maybe a deep dive or uh, not a deep dive, but a, a little bit of a dive into a specific problem to tell you how I think about these kinds of challenges for data science and for AI as well. Um, so, you know, the last mile of any data science application is getting the information and this insight out of the computer and in, into the head decision maker, the human being who's going to actually have to operate on the basis of the information and the analysis that have been derived from all the data that have been gathered. And um, I hope it's clear that there's really, in some sense, uh, until the machines are making all the decisions automatically by themselves without human intervention, um, uh, which may never happen. Uh, there's really no point in gathering and analyzing all the data that we're gathering and analyzing if we can't convey the results to people in a way they understand, take action on. And, and because of the amounts of data that are being gathered and the amount of analysis that's being done, and because of the number of people who need to get this data for all sorts of reasons, and this analysis and this insight for all sorts of reasons, both um, uh, a personal, business, professional, uh, societal, all kinds of things uh, to make their decisions, this has to happen at scale, all right? So this, this means that there has to be some mechanism for automatically somehow presenting information to people. This was really the impetus behind the rise of the critical importance of visualization systems, um, data visualization, data dashboards, and so on in computer science and then human computer interaction to really make it to make this happen, to make it possible to kind of bridge that gap between what the machine is doing and what human decision makers really need. Uh, now, we took a, a little bit of a different angle on this, which was rather than actually uh, developing charts and graphs automatically, we, we got interested in developing stories automatically, data-driven data, data -driven narratives that would convey the information to people in the form of stories. And we founded a company, Narrative Science, a little more than a decade ago, and it was recently acquired uh, by Salesforce and its Tableau unit, which I think makes a lot of sense in the context of what I just said, Tableau being, of course, the world's leading data visualization platform. Um, and so the purpose of the company was to make the world's data meaningful to people through stories. Uh, here's the punchline of the kind of stuff we were able to do today with, uh, with AI and natural processing. We can start with a bunch of data like these data here. Uh, these are the data, I'm sorry, uh, these are data about a, uh, a hockey game, a youth hockey game um, in the United States. And here is a story automatically generated uh, based, based on that game. The Rio Grande Valley killer bees were firing on all cylinders against the Laredo Bucks. And when the final buzzer sounded, killer bees emerged with the six to three win. Zach Pearson was all over the ice for Rio Grande Valley as he tallied two goals and one assist in the win. Pearson scored the first of his two goals at 523 into the first period to make the score one to nothing Rio Grande Valley and so forth. So this is the kind of thing that's possible to generate uh, automatically. And um, I think that, uh, I, I hope you can see that for many people, this is really the right way to convey the information 
as opposed to the chart that, that I showed you previously of all the data that this story is, is kind of presenting and summarizing and, and kind of making meaningful. So uh, of course the company has done business stories as well. So here we have uh, data about the company Red Hat and uh, some of its, some information about it. And here we can generate a quarterly earnings preview for Forbes.com based on these data. Uh, here we have a quarterly earnings preview for Home Depot based again on data about, um, about, uh, about the company. Um, sector reporting. So I, I hope it's clear that the kinds of stories that are, that are relevant are going to be business stories, finance stories, sports stories, any uh, health stories, crime stories, any data rich uh, uh, area. Uh, where people need to understand the results of the analysis. So here, for example, is sector reporting about the healthcare, uh, healthcare industry inside the stock market. The healthcare sector underperformed the market in early trading on Thursday. Um, uh, Merck erased early losses of 0.6% to $31.26 per share, and so on. Okay. So why stories? Why are, why are we, why did we focus on this? So uh, I guess maybe the punchline of this. Um, example is, uh, and I'll talk about this again a little bit later, is that even little data is, is big data. Uh, because here we have a, a, spread, uh, a, a section of a spreadsheet with two rows and I don't know, 12 or 12 columns or something like that, or not 10 columns. And it's not really very much data at all, but you know, if you're looking at this, at this table, it's actually not easy to glean what's the takeaway? What am I supposed to understand looking at these numbers? You know, so I might draw a graph of them, and I draw this graph uh, of these two of these two rows, and I, I begin to see something a little bit easier in this in this picture um, that I see in the table itself. But finally, if we generate a story, we might generate something like this: Over the past eight quarters, Amgen Corp has seen a steady increase in both sales and gross profit. Um, during this period, however, two trends have become apparent. While sales have been have increased, there has been a steady decrease in margins, which should be cause for concern. In addition, while we have seen quarter to quarter increases in both sales and gross profit, each of these metrics is decelerating, indicating that the experience, business is experiencing a slowdown. So, I mean, the main point here being that, that uh, these, um, both of these curves are going up, and that's maybe the main headline story, but they're diverging, okay? And gross profit is rising more slowly than sales. And second of all, that they're actually decelerating a little bit. The second, the second derivative is not, um, is, not, is not so favorable as the first. And, and so this story actually highlights these facts that might not even be visible to, a, to the eye of a, let's say, a naive reader. Uh, and that's the purpose of the story. So in other words, stories will pick out, connect, and summarize the critical aspects of the situation. They explain things. They convey the trends, the causes, and even can make recommendations. They provide context, and they make data meaningful. So that's really why we went down this path. Um, here, I want to briefly exit this and give a quick demo uh, this is the first prototype that we built at Northwestern. Uh, it was built, uh, actually, I apologize. This is the second prototype that we built at Northwestern University. This was finished in early 2011. The first prototype was built in 2010, so more than a decade ago now. Um, and it was built, built around the idea of um, baseball games, which is a minor variant of cricket pursued in North America. Um, and uh, uh, it, it, the idea was to take baseball game data box scores, line scores, and play-by-play -play data, which you see here, um, and actually turn that into what's called a baseball game recap, a story that would describe what happened in the game. Um, and so we, um, this is the, uh, a 2000, this, this game happened before the program was written. It's uh, uh, um, fourth, 20, 2009, the Philadelphia Phillies playing the New York Yankees in New York City. Um, and it's probably a World Series game given the date. And so we'll push this button here and write the story uh, based on these. And we get the following story here. Let me, um, uh, Mitsui drives in six to lift Yankees to victory over Phillies. An impressive effort by Hideki Mitsui led the New York Yankees to a 73 victory over the Philadelphia Phillies on Wednesday at Yankee Stadium. Mitsui went three for four at the plate and drove in six Yankees runners. Mitsui homered in the second inning scoring Alex Ruiz being a single third inning scoring Johnny Damon and Derek Jeter and doubled in the fifth inning scoring Rodriguez and Mark Texera. And I apologize, it's, the system's a little bit broken right now. There's supposed to be a picture here of Matsui um, because the machine understands that he was the most important player in the game. So this is actually a pretty good story. Um, it's as good 
pretty much as what's called, as I said, the AP short recap, which is typically written by human beings within an hour or so after the end of a professional baseball game. Um, and it's really when we started getting results like this that we thought it might be worth um, thinking about founding a company. Um, so uh, let me go back to the, uh, to the slides now. Um, uh, and as I said, this first prototype was built at Northwestern. Um, and here we actually have the, uh, uh, with, a, with a, a photo of Mitsui, uh, oh, actually Griffey, this is a different game, but you, you see the point. Um, and actually right after we did this, XKCD is an online comic um, that's done this kind of uh, cute, youthful line drawing scheme. And they generated the following comic uh, called All Sports Commentary, a weighted random number generator just pr produced a new batch of numbers. Let's use them to build narratives, which for some strange reason we actually Never did what we should have done, actually. I think that would have been a lot of fun. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, even, big data is, uh, even little data is big data. Uh, Ritu, how much more time do I have? About uh, 10 more minutes? Sure, sir. Less than 10 minutes? Yeah, less than, uh, around 10 minutes should be good. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, as I, well, the first thing I want to say is that uh, as I mentioned before, you, you can't really see the story in these data. So, okay, let's say we want to, we want to generate natural language and this maybe recapitulate our thought processes as we started down this path of how do we do this? So we say like, well, let's generate natural language based on these data. Okay, here's natural language based on these data. In Q1, sales were 12.6 million, gross profit was 9 million. In Q2, sales were 15.6 million, gross profit was 12.4 million. In Q3, sales were 19.97 million. Gross profit was 15.77 million, dot, dot, dot. You know, and I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna, every, I'm gonna uh, uh, explicitly um, uh, enunciate every single, uh, all the data and every single column in this very small spreadsheet. You know, that's not a story. I mean, this is actually even worse than this uh, in terms of comprehensibility. So this makes it clear right away that storytelling requires selection. Um, and the core storytelling is not natural language generation in a narrow sense, i.e. it's not text generation, it's much more what to say rather than how to say it. That's the issue. When you look at a lot of data, you have to figure out what is it I'm supposed to say about these data? And that's really the critical, the critical issue is selecting what to say. And so if you're gonna select what to say to somebody, you need some model of what they need to know, okay? Of what they need, what they wanna hear. And so another way of saying that is, what questions do they have about the situation that these data uh, represent or were generated by, um, or the questions that they should have if they were better informed, all right? And so right away, we see that the heart of data storytelling is gonna be questions and modeling questions. So just to lead you through very quickly how I would think about this, you know, if we think about the, uh, uh, the questions and then the answers that a, that a story will, uh, that will generate a story, what do we need to model the questions? Well, we need to know what data do we need to answer this question? So if we're going to model a question, we have to say, well, what's, what data do we need? What kind of analysis do we need to run on those data? What kind of results will those analytics return? And how do we form those results into answers to the question that we started with? How do we characterize the results? And finally, what other questions will the answer raise? And so that's kind of how we set about modeling questions in the system that we built. So for example, here's a very simple, uh, or straightforward question, um, who was our best salesperson last quarter? So the data obviously that we need will be the last quarter sales by salesperson. The analytics are gonna be relatively simple. It's either the maximum on this list or sort the list and take the first element. And the results will be a name and or an ID and a number, the number being the actual sales or a sort of list of names and numbers. But that's not an answer to the question. The answer to the question is gonna be, X's sales were the maximum ad, or X had the highest sales, or X was the best salesperson with sales of, you know, N million dollars last quarter, okay? So that's how you have to, these are the, the four answers that the, uh, to the question of how do we formulate a uh, question, the meta question of how to formulate a question that we need to do to actually solve this problem. Um, I'm going to skip this in the, uh, in the interest of time, but but uh, one thing that we did, well, actually, one thing that we did discover that was interesting is that there are words in, I think, all human languages, but obviously the one that I'm familiar with is English, that actually say a great deal about data in a very small and compact way. So 
if I tell you that this was a comeback victory in a game, you know exactly what happened. That some one team was ahead, and then very late in the game, the other team came back and won the game. Um, or, uh, um, for example, what does it mean to say sales were uh, a profits? Uh, um, you know, were held uh, profits were were flat as uh, um, strong sales in um, uh, South Asia were held back by uh, by uh, decreasing business in North and South America or something like that. So the word held back or the phrase held back, you know, really tells a great story about, you know, the relationship between uh, those numbers and how they led to the top line result that we're talking about. Um, in general, the story generation process that we're talking about here comes from middle out. We start with what is the, what is the, what is the reader need to know? Okay, and so we're gonna start with this. Um, and then, and then, but the process itself is going to go this direction. We're going to start with the data. We're going to do some analytics. We're going to turn those the results uh, into answers to the questions um, in the way that we just described. We're going to actually those will answer the questions. Then finally, we have to organize that information to make a story. Uh, I'm going to skip this part here, but just to, just in the interest of time, but just to make the point that we've done a lot of data. We did a lot of sports stories. This is uh, college softball games in the Midwest. We did a lot of civics data. We worked with a, an organization called ProPublica, which is a large um, nonprofit uh, public sector reporting organization in New York. Uh, we wrote stories about 52,000 um, public schools in the United States um, describing their, uh, the educational attainment of their students you know, as modulated by the socioeconomic conditions of the town in which they lived and the demographics of the student population. And here's a story that was generated about Evanston Township High School, which is the town that I lived in at the time and the school that my children went to. We've done stories about social media data. Uh, uh, and the idea here is to make big data personal. I mean, the, the critical point I wanna make here is that you don't need a machine to tell 10 stories. You just, you get some people to write those stories. You don't even need a machine necessarily to write a hundred or a thousand stories. You need a machine to write hundreds of thousands or millions of stories. and the, the reason you need to write those many stories is that um, you have that many people who actually need information that's tailored to them to answer the questions that they have about the problems that are, they're confronting. So here, for example, we have, um, and this will be my final example, maybe we have the um, point of sales data from a uh, fast food franchise in the United States, which is very highly uh, um, monitored. Um, uh, the, now, the, the managers of these fast food franchise restaurants are extremely busy people, as you can expect, and they don't have time to look at these data or look at the analyses of these data in any technical way. And they're not even, in some sense, educated to do that. They have a much broader education in, uh, um, you know, in how to, how, to run a, how to run a business. And um, uh, specifically here, we want to turn this into something that's actionable by then. So here's the story that we generated, and the uh, products have been um, the products have been uh, changed to protect the 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 particular client we were dealing with at the time, but uh, or to sanitize that or or vanillaize it. Uh, you know, one thing I thought when I when we were writing these stories is we should give a we should, we need to give a a, a gift to the manager at the end. She's a busy person. You know, she needs to understand, we have to tell her something at the end of the story that is immediately actionable by her. And we realized, why don't we tell her where she, the one high margin item she's underperforming her peers on and how much more money she could make if she brought her performance up to her peers. So um, uh, Ruben sandwiches were this week's weakest menu item with average daily sales of 136.7 units. Um, Gross margins on the item declined 20% for the previous week. This is the second week in a row that margins on Ruben sandwiches have fallen. Bringing source daily sales of Ruben sandwiches up to the same level as the co-ops, that's the regional grouping of these, of these uh, franchises, would add about $566 more dollars in profit each month over a year. That's an extra $6,828. The store only needs to sell six more units per day to accomplish this. So this gives that manager an actionable goal that will lead to immediate benefits if, they, if it can be achieved. Uh, the company Narrative Science has gone on to build a, a, a lot of products, um, especially actually, um, and maybe in most uh, 
significantly for the outcome of the company was we built a, a connection to Tableau um, as well as Click and Power BI that would actually automatically generate narratives uh, based on visualizations that you were doing. Um, there's a number of other products under development, including a product called Lexio. You know, we still do youth sports because it's so much fun and it's very satisfying. Here's a, uh, and we have generate several million youth sports stories every, every year in the United States, uh, primarily baseball, but I think basketball as well. Um, you know, and here's a story that we generated about uh, Cap Morris doing a great job as a pitcher for the uh, um, um, uh, Richmond Rampage uh, uh, in a, in a, in a uh, youth uh, baseball game. And what's exciting about this really is that this story is only going to be read by a few people, Kat Morris herself and um, her parents and siblings, friends, grandparents. But uh, that's the point of, uh, of, of, of scaling in this way. You can actually personalize these stories for people who really care about them. So um, I think that's really the future of automated uh, storytelling in my mind is uh, more insightful, more sophisticated, more personalized and interactive narratives. But ultimately the idea is to make big data personal, understandable and actionable for everyone. And so that's really, that's really the goal of the, of, the, um, of the work. And so thank you very much for allowing me the, the time to lead you through this little mini journey of my own discovery and how I kind of went around building this product uh, and project along with many colleagues and, and, and students, um, just a few of whom were mentioned here. Uh, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Dr. Dari, um, for enlightening us about the importance of data storytelling and, and telling us about how we should focus on the what rather than the how. Um, we have a question for you, and I'm just going to read it out. Um, so it says that, can we also envisage a situation where two contrasting stories get generated from the same data set just because some intersecting data overlaps uh, are overlooked. Um, for example, historical distortion of political facts based on ideological preferences. Uh, Dr. Harry, you're on mute. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So that's, that's a great question. And actually we did a sort of simple variant of that, which is we can tell, we did do a version where we would tell the story of a baseball game from the point of view of the winner and the loser. So that if the, um, if, the, uh, uh, um, if, the, if the winner won the game barely, you know, uh, maybe the headline would be, you know, the winner holds off the loser. But, if the, uh, but from the loser's perspective, it would be like nearly overcome, you know, kind of uh, um, heartbreaking, heartbreakingly close defeat or something like that. So, so we did actually do a little bit of that um, um, in terms of winners versus losers in competitive sports. I think the point, specific point you raise about how does it change the story to include more context or more information? You know, I think that's a that's a, a very profound question, and um, you know, I'd have to give that a lot more thought. I mean, one particularly thorny question it raises is the issue of having ex an explicit discussion about what elements of information or contextual information are relevant to the discussion, which is, I think, something that people do that I don't know is yet within the, you know, within what AI is capable of doing. But I, but great question. And I think certainly it is the case that the more that we can generate stories that are data driven stories that are factual and yet show um, different perspectives, I think that's, that's a valuable thing, both to show that there is inevitably going to be bias in the way that analytics are done, but also to help overcome that bias by showing the different potential points of view that can be, that can be developed. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Larry.